Malden Brothers Barbershop still stands today, giving haircuts out of the same chairs that some of the icons of the Civil Rights Movement sat in. This is the story of the friendship between Nelson Malden and his most famous client, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Sixty years ago, bigotry and hate had stained the city of Montgomery. The city was segregated. There were very few places for black citizens to shop, eat, or sleep. But one neighborhood, Centennial Hill, was the place to be if you were black. That's where all the black uh, bourgeoisie live. On High Street was a grocery store, a doctor's office, and restaurants, all catering to black citizens. But the biggest building in the neighborhood, the Ben Moore Hotel, was a fixture in the community. You had the lodging, you had the alcohol, and then you also had the food service within that same, same building. It was on the facilities at that time for, for blacks. It was in this building that Nelson Malden and his brother would open Malden Brothers Barbershop. And it was here where Nelson and a young preacher from Atlanta, Georgia, first met. I saw the blue Pontiac pull up in front of the shop, and I figured by, he must have been a customer coming to get a haircut. I looked at his head, I said, oh heck, I can knock him out in 15 minutes. The man in that blue Pontiac would change the world. I asked him, what was your name? He said, Martin Luther King. I said, where are you from? He said, Lana, Georgia. I said, what are you doing here? He said, I'm here to preach my crowd. So I'm in I said, oh, good to meet you. It was 1954 when Nelson first met Dr. King. At the time, Nelson was still a student at Alabama State University, and King was just a rookie preacher taking his first assignment to pastor a church. But over the next eight years, what started as a haircut would develop into a friendship. In the barbershop, they already refer to it as the Black Man Country Club. So we talk about something and everything. You talk about religion, you talk about politics, sometimes you talk about sex. The barbershop was a place of refuge, a place where fathers took their sons and people left feeling empowered and enlightened. Dr. King and his family lived at 309 South Jackson Street. Countless times Dr. King walked this path from his house to Nelson's barbershop. He'd come down to the barbershop and do a little writing and sometimes do a little reading. And he had, we had a little crash can, he threw some of those notes that he was writing in the crash can. And I said, if I could have saved some of those notes, I probably could have bought everybody in Montgomery Porsche. As the Montgomery bus boycott gained steam and the civil rights movement grew, Dr. King became a prominent figure for human rights in the United States. Another fact that helped make Reverend King was the negative force. Reverend King represented the positive force. By this time, Dr. King was so recognizable that he traveled with security. Nelson says they believe the security was provided by the Lyndon B. Johnson administration. But after delivering a speech denouncing the Vietnam War on April 4, 1967, Dr. King's security disappeared. My brother asked him, where is your security now? We never discussed security with him. That's when he took his finger. He said, the man who stands with me now. And that was the very last word I heard him say. Then he went to Memphis, Tennessee. Four months later, you know what happened to him. Exactly one year after his speech in New York City, Dr. King was assassinated in Memphis, Tennessee on April 4, 1968. After his death, the Civil Rights Act would become law and integration began. But the Centennial Hill community was falling into disrepair and black-owned businesses struggled to keep up with their corporate competition. Reverend King said, you better be careful what you ask for, you might get it. So we asked for public, we asked for integration, but we had no idea the impact it would have on black business. Over the years, Nelson had compiled dozens of pictures of Dr. King and other prominent figures from the movement that were customers of the barbershop. In 2019, Nelson donated some of these priceless relics to the Smithsonian Institute. I gave 16 items to the Smithsonian. The Ben Moore Hotel is now a shuttered eyesore on Centennial Hill, and people are still fighting for social equality and civil rights. Don't question the whole country made progress, but I think he'd be very disturbed to see what's going on in Washington right now. Nelson Malden is retired now, but the shop is still open in its original location. All right. Thank you, Jerome. The items Nelson Malden gave to the Smithsonian Institute now have their own display at the National Museum of African-American History.